Hey, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, in the middle of a long weekend, uh, evening of 14th August. It, I think, is a testament to your dedication to the subject and um, the, the fame and eminence of our speaker uh, this evening. Um, as you know, democracy, uh, the, there's a lot of discussion around democracy, and I think five or seven years ago, the tenor of the discussion was, how do we make democracies more representative? How do we make democracies more deliberative? Um, can we square the ideals of democracy with the aspirations of social justice? Um, broadly speaking, the contours of the debate were, how do we deepen democracy uh, so that it lives up to what is its supposed promise? I'm using the word supposed sort of uh, deliberately. Uh, I think we are at a historical juncture where it's fair, fair to say that many of the democracies that we live in, there has been a considerable backsliding even on what we thought of as basic constitutional norms constitutive of liberal democracies, uh, freedom of expression, assembly, movement, so on and so forth. And so it's really an opportune time uh, to think about where democracy goes from here, uh, uh, as it were. And there's no better person to guide us through this labyrinth of challenges democracy is facing than Philippe Van Paris. Um, my personal estimation, I think he's one of the most uh, important of contemporary political theorists. Uh, he's most famously known for spawning the debate around basic income, uh, which has become not just a philosophical idea, uh, but also a global social and policy movement. And what Philippe brought to that debate, uh, and this is directed at the young Ashoka undergraduates here, was that extraordinary ideal uh, combination of philosophical skills, economic reasoning, a long-range historical perspective and a very acute political acumen, uh, which has made basic income now at least one of those debates that is central to uh, so many liberal democracies. Um, even the United States has a presidential candidate uh, who's at least put forth this idea, something we thought was unimaginable years ago. Uh, but Philippe has also worked on such a range of things. I mean, I don't want to go through his extraordinary CV. Uh, uh, professor at Louvain, um, uh, taught for many years at Harvard, Oxford, Berkeley. Uh, he's literally been uh, uh, as it were, all over the world. But one of the reasons that I think that makes Philippe's work so important at this particular conjuncture is that his work is some, has some of the most clear-eyed analysis of the nature of democracy that you'll find. Uh, there's a 1996 paper of his, a very short paper, very provocative paper, uh, Are Justice and Democracy Compatible? Right? Um, and I think it was one of those exercises in both philosophical clarity and, again, political reality right? that actually forces us to confront both our conceptual confusions and how we normatively overload our concepts. We think our concepts can do our political and institutional work for us. Uh, and I think that paper was very fruitful in spawning a whole debate. Why did we ever expect that uh, democracy as we understand it, majoritarian, representative, uh, 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 electoral democracy, would necessarily produce social justice? Um, and I think in that spirit, Philip has produced an extraordinary range of papers, um, uh, uh, some dealing with the EU, some dealing with theoretical aspects um, uh, of democracy. And I just want to make a pitch for uh, his new book that's just come out uh, called Just Democracy, the Rawls-Machiavelli Program. And it's a testament to Philippe's originality that you see actually the Rawls-Machiavelli pairing, which is very unusual. Um, so he's the ideal person to, as it were, provoke reflections on where democracy goes from here. He'll be referring primarily to Europe, but I think what he has to say will be of um, much more general interest. So, Philippe, we are really grateful uh, that you took this time out, and the floor is yours.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prata. What first made me uh, think about the issue I want uh, to discuss today, um, what first led me to the way in which I approach uh, this issue, is something that happened in this country nearly a century ago. In 1992, when I was attending a talk back in Louvain, I learned something amazing. Namely, that someone could undertake a hunger strike about what looked like from the outside, about what looked from the outside like a very small, insignificant feature of an electoral system. This was, as most of you will have guessed, this was Gandhi's successful six-day hunger strike in September 1932 against Ambedkar's proposal to have um, separate seats reserved for Dalits, to have uh, for the various assemblies in India seats reserved for Dalits, but with separate electorates. The outcome, as also probably most of you know, was a compromise accepted by the British and later incorporated in uh, the Indian uh, constitution, supposed to last initially for only 10 years, but renewed ever since, a compromise which kept the reserved seats, but not the separate electorates. And there are two features of the Pune Pact, this compromise, that are crucial for my way of thinking about democracy and the relationship between democracy and justice. First, among the standard minimal conditions for a regime to be called democratic, there is, of course, universal suffrage, the right to vote for any, uh, for any, for every adult member of the community, but also universal eligibility. But an astonishing feature of the Pune Pact is that it transgresses this minimum condition. In nearly 20% of the constituencies for the national and for the state assemblies, the majority of the citizens, sometimes even an overwhelming majority of the citizens, is not eligible. This looks like a violation of some people's fundamental political rights, namely the members of uh, castes that are not protected by these uh, reservations in the constituencies with a reserved seats. The, this looks bizarre. The right of eligibility uh, is included, for example, in the list of fundamental rights that constitutes John Rawls's first principle of justice. His first principle covers a number of fundamental freedoms, including political rights, the right of, to vote, and uh, the right of uh, being eligible. Is this scandalous? Is this a scandalous feature of uh, the Pune Pact and so of the present electoral system in this country? Is this unacceptable? No, it's not. Because reflection, it's not in my view, because uh, reflection on this case persuaded me that there is nothing sacrosanct about democracy. Uh, persuaded me that democracy is not a name in itself, that the objective cannot be maximal democracy, but rather optimal democracy, that is, a more or less democratic regime that is best suited as a tool for something else, and this something else for me is social justice. Hence, if sacrificing universal eligibility um, will help or is likely to help promote social justice, then let's sacrifice it. This is the first feature. And it brings me to the second feature of the Pune Pact that uh, turned out to be crucial for my thinking about this issue, namely its rejection of separate electorates. 
This rejection obtained by Gandhi struck me straight away as exceedingly sensible in the light of what was happening and indeed is still happening as I speak today in my own tiny country, Belgium. We have in Belgium what can be called an ethnic conflict between the Dutch-speaking Flemish majority in the north and the French-speaking Walloon majority, minority in the south. Until the 1970s, we had essentially three political parties covering the whole of the country. But in the aftermath of a crisis around the expulsion of my own university, French-speaking University of Louvain, from the old university town of Leuven in Dutch-speaking uh, Flemish territory, all parties, all three parties, national parties, split along the linguistic cleavage. The result uh, is that you now have two sets of political parties with separate electorates because of the geographical uh, configuration of the linguistic divide. Two sets of political parties, each, uh, with, uh, each party having projects, programs, that uh, are uh, meant to promote the general interest, not of the country as a whole, but of their own separate electorate, if need be, at the expense of the other part of the country's population. This is uh, the sort of institutionally induced conflict that Gandhi's hunger strike, that the Pune Pact managed to avoid in this country. Indeed, a, con a conflict in the case of India that would likely have been uh, for, uh, far more serious than the one we currently have in Belgium because of the cohabitation of the two groups that would have separate, uh, uh, would have been structured in separate e electorates, and also because of the far greater inequality uh, between these two groups. Nonetheless, it was important, and that was also and the other aspect and the other uh, component of the Puna Pax, it was important to find a way of forcing the political system to take properly into account the interests, the feelings, the voices of a part of a systematically underprivileged part of the population. And it was and, uh, important to secure a, a substantial, a substantial uh, presence of this group in the assemblies. And one in, in uh, securing this uh, presence in the assemblies is one important, indeed arguably an indispensable way of achieving this. Given that the British apparently considered that proportional representation, it was said at the time, was too complicated for the Indians, that first part of the post, if good enough for the Brits, was also good enough for the Indians, the only way of securing this was to create reserved seats, reserved constituency. Was the system that emerged from the Pune Pact good for social justice? Was it better than the two other options between which it was a compromise, namely uh, reserved seats with separate, with separate uh, electorates or no uh, guaranteed representation at all? Uh, well, I believe that the answer to this question is yes. I read just in the last few days and on my way uh, to India an excellent uh, recent book by someone who uh, several of you know, Francesca Iancenius, uh, under the title, uh, with the title Social Justice Through I Inclusion, the Consequences of Electoral Quotas in India. In the book, she distinguishes three senses following Nancy Fraser, three senses of uh, justice, of social justice. There is uh, justice in distribution, justice in recognition, and justice in participation. The conclusion of her book is that there is no doubt in her view that uh, the uh, reservation systems as structured with the design that emerged from the Pune Pact 
had a positive impact on justice uh, in recognition, on justice in participation, but she says it's not so obvious for justice in uh, distribution. Um, why? Well, one, because when you look in detail at uh, the differences between reserved constituencies and general constituencies, you notice that there is no, that the situation of the Dalits is not uh, significantly better uh, in uh, those with reserve, with reserve seats than in the others. And secondly, when you uh, interview Dalit uh, assembly members, they say that uh, their mission as uh, members of parliament, or members of uh, uh, assemblies, is to represent all uh, the, to represent the views, the interests of all the citizens in their constituency, and not only uh, the Dalits. And that what they do in the policies they advocate is to follow the party line, um, including on uh, socioeconomic issues that may affect the situation of the Dalits. However, she also reports in her book that the socioeconomic gap between Dalits and the other castes has narrowed very considerably since the reservation seats were, the reserve seats were in place, whereas the gap between Hindus and Muslims has not, as you probably know too, it was um, before the war and uh, until shortly before independence, it was also, um, uh, there was also a plan to have reserved uh, constituencies for, in the same way for uh, religious minorities, but uh, after partition, this idea was abandoned. And this fact, uh, this difference between the shrinking gap between Dalits and other castes versus the uh, uh, not the, the, continuous, the continued uh, gap between Hindus and Muslims. This uh, fact is far more relevant to the question of the impact of the electoral system on uh, distributive justice than any difference there might have been between reserved and general constituencies. For it is the obligation to hear and to be heard by Dalits in assemblies, the obligation for parties to recruit suitable candidates among the Dalit population that provides the mechanism through which, in the long term, the interests of the um, disadvantaged groups um, with reserve seats will be more fairly taken into account than those of groups that are not entitled uh, to uh, this particular guarantee. It is this sort of analysis, confirmed by uh, Jensenius' uh, book, that convinced me that the fine grain of the design of democratic institutions is of crucial importance for the achievability and the sustainability of measures, policies, institutions that reduce social injustice. And from this conviction follows what are called and uh, uh, Pratap has already referred to it, uh, what I call the Rawls Machiavelli program. Machiavelli, why? It's not the Machiavelli of the prince, huh? the Machiavellian Machiavelli. It's the Machiavelli of the Discorsi, which is his other bigger book, which is an, an analysis of the reasons why the Roman Republic did well, was great at certain periods of uh, its history, with certain institutions, whereas it was decaying, it was decadent, collapsed at other periods of its history, with the same people, with the same ADN, uh, uh, DNA at, uh, uh, the, in these various periods. But say so what's crucial is the institutions. So what I'm interested in is not what sort of institutions are best uh, for the sake of making a city or a nation great, but uh, what institutions are best for making a uh, society more just. That's why it's a Rawls-Machiavelli program where Rawls has to be the boss, that is, Rawls as the founding father of contemporary theories of justice, is the one who has to think about what the objective is, what the ultimate standard is for assessing institutions, and then Machiavelli has to do the, the subtle, uh, astute work of trying to find how institutions can be, made, can be shaped, how political institutions can be shaped 
in order to achieve as well as possible this objective. Now, as uh, hinted at before from the point of view of uh, this rolls machiavelli program, uh, which doesn't mean from the point of view of the best interpretation of either rolls of Machiavelli, but from the point of view of this, um, uh, of this rolls machiavelli program, <coughs> even uh, the choice for democracy must not be taken for granted. However, electoral democracy has, uh, democracy in general, and particularly electoral democracy, has three important virtues which uh, jointly support the conviction that, it, that electoral democracy needs to occupy a central place in any social justice friendly institutional setup. I'll quickly go through these three virtues. One I call the disciplining force of self-infliction. The second one I call the informational force of vote fetching. And the third one I call the civilizing force of hypocrisy. First then, the disciplining force of self-infliction. An in an electoral democracy, the people who govern, who govern us, are the people we citizens chose. We may not like them. We may have voted for other candidates, for other parties. But if the system is sufficiently fair, is the rules are not rigged, a majority among us, majorities, sometimes only a very relative majority, but a majority defined as defined by the rules of the game, a majority among us has chosen these rules, and a majority may, among us may kick them out at the next election. This is key to the peaceful management of political conflict, it's key to a civic peace that is a precondition for social justice. And this sharply contrasts, of course, with the frequently violent replacement of rulers in undemocratic regimes. I remember that uh, uh, shortly after uh, Donald Trump was elected president of the United States, I was then in Florence, and I was reading a fascinating book about the time of the Medici and how the Medici family came to power through, among other acts of violence, uh, uh, killing about 1,000 citizens of uh, the small city of Prato uh, near Florence. And this was typical of the way in which uh, one ruling family was replacing another ruling family at that time. And by contrast, I saw, uh, I was in a way, moved by seeing on television the first encounter between Donald Trump and Barack Obama in the White House, and where Barack Obama, also most, arguably the most powerful uh, political, in the most powerful political position at the time, Barack Obama, uh, was not a matter of acts of violence, no, it said uh, my wife, Michelle, and myself are very pleased to welcome you, uh, Mr. Trump, in, uh, in the White House. We will show you around in the house and do, my staff will do everything that, that can in order to make you adjust, etc. What a wonderful show of civilization. Huh? So how you have uh, there I mean, the most powerful position that is changing hands there in this way. Of course, Obama was thinking, what a bastard this guy, and he didn't even have uh, a majority of the people who voted uh, my candidate and more, and uh, I couldn't have dreamt of a, a more sinister successor. But nevertheless, it was welcome, Mr. Trump, and, uh, and the new first lady, and uh, Phil Com Phil, et cetera. Well, this is just a remarkable achievement. And so there is this aspect of the, the civic peace uh, that is brought about by this first virtue of an electoral democracy, which I call the disciplining force of self-infliction. So we, the, the people, we, the citizens, inflicted on ourselves, that is a majority of us, the people who rule us, and that gives them a sort of legitimacy, which, of course, the people who are there by virtue of a coup, by virtue of uh, uh, their birth, uh, don't have. Second virtue, the informational force of vote-fetching. 
um, contrary to aristocratic, autocratic, bureaucratic, technocratic, plutocratic rulers, democratic rulers need to be elected. They need to fetch votes. And this forces them to listen to a great variety of people very different from themselves. And they buy to learn about their problems, about their perception of these problems, about the solutions these people may be thinking of to solve these problems. And this tends to make democratic rulers structurally better informed about the country's real needs than other rulers. Under an electoral democracy, the information needed to seize and to retain power is structurally closer than under alternative regimes to the information needed to do what is in the interest of the population of the country. First, I found there was a very powerful uh, formulation of this uh, second virtue of an electoral democracy in um, the work of someone called Josh, uh, jo uh, Joshua Ober, a professor at Stanford, uh, who was trying to understand why uh, Athens in ancient Greeks emerged as the most powerful uh, Greek state, despite this extremely slow, clumsy, conflictual uh, uh, political regime they had, which was called democracy. And his argument, well, well precisely, the, the rulers there in Greece knew far more about what was going on in that country because of the need to uh, be elected. That's the second version. And thirdly, the most important version of all three for the achievement of social justice, which is the civilizing force of hypocrisy. It's an expression which I borrow from the Norwegian philosopher Jon Elster. Second Norwegian I quote here because uh, Jensenius is also Norwegian. Um, so uh, Elster uses that expression to describe uh, a central feature of any democracy that functions well. The idea here is that a good democratic process is not primarily an aggregation, but a conversation. It does not, so a good democratic process does not consist in detecting, collecting pre-existing preferences, pre-existing interests in order to generate collective choices that fit uh, these, uh, uh, these preferences, these interests as well as possible. But a good uh, democracy rather consists in shaping through public deliberation collective preferences that will uh, guide collective decisions that are both efficient and fair. The civilizing force of hypocrisy is crucial in this process. What do I mean by that? Well, public, public deliberation in an electoral Democracy takes the form of proposals of decisions that are uh, being made, being defended, being discussed, criticized publicly before the whole electorate. What does one say to defend or to attack a program, a proposal, a decision, a policy? One doesn't say this is good or this is bad because it goes against or it is favorable to my own personal interest. Or one doesn't defend a proposal by saying, well, this is good for the people who paid for my campaign. Or one doesn't say, well, this is a good proposal because it's good for the rich in this country. No. What one does say, what one is forced to say in this context, is oh, this is a good proposal because it's in the general interest of the population before whom we have to justify it or because it's in the interest of the weakest or the most vulnerable in uh, our population. And I, this is what I mean by civilizing the democratic speech. And what is conveyed by the term hypocrisy here is uh, not that everyone uh, taking part in this debate is hypocritical, but that it doesn't really matter what really motivates the people 
hmm, to say what they are saying. It doesn't matter what they are saying. What matters is that they would say it. Hmm. This it matters that they say it, providing the civilizing force doesn't limit itself to the speech, but also to the acts, to uh, the deeds. And that will happen if the landscape is right. That is, if you have next uh, to uh, these uh, arenas in which uh, uh, people speak, uh, if you have a number of other institutions that play the role they are supposed to play, namely the opposition, the press, the academia, and civil society organization. Because of this third virtue, but also because of the second uh, virtue I mentioned uh, before, so the informational virtue, the informational force of vote fetching, electoral democracy is superior also to direct democracy. Because an individual vote uh, casting his secret vote in a referendum does not need to bother informing himself about the problems and the feelings of other people very different from himself. And also because that individual vote, casting a secret vote, doesn't need to justify his choice publicly by reference to some notion of fairness or some notion of the common good. These are, in my view, uh, these three virtues are, in my view, highly significant uh, virtues of electoral democracy. And therefore, they jointly provide a very powerful argument in favor of such a regime. However, this doesn't prevent some versions of electoral democracy or electoral democracy functioning under some circumstances. It doesn't prevent them from uh, seeming deficient, sometimes even hopeless, as far as the pursuit of social justice is concerned. And some recent trends may even make us wonder whether the virtues are slowly being turned into vices. Let me then quickly go through some of these worries as they are vented, as they feature in the current European context. Um, and also go through some of the attempts to address uh, these worries. And I'll go through four uh, worries and four attempts to address them under the headings of language, electoral space, deliberative assemblies, and voice. Language. That will be the rest of the program uh, for my presentation. First of all, I said before, a good democracy is a good conversation. And there is no good conversation without a shared language. This is why John Stuart Mill, in 1860 or so, in his book, uh, Considerations on Representative Government, in his famous uh, chapter 16 on nationality, this is why John Stuart Mill predicted that as despotic institutions are being replaced by democratic institutions, political borders will tend to coincide with linguistic borders. He admitted that there might be exceptions. And he mentioned Belgium, a little country, as one of them. But this was at a time when French was the only official language in, uh, uh, in Belgium, where this was also at a time when only a fraction of the population had a small fraction, rich fraction of the population had voting rights, and a time when the elite, this rich fraction in the whole of the country, spoke French. So this was not really an exception to his rule. At the very end of the 19th century, Dutch was, in Belgium, was given next to French an official uh, status, that, that is 70 years after the creation of uh, Belgium. And the Dutch-speaking Flemings, majority in the population, gradually got the right to speak Dutch in Parliament and in courts. They got their own schools, they got their own universities, they got their own media. And now, 
the biggest political party in the country is a Flemish nationalist country, which keeps repeating that Belgium consists of not one, but two democracies, and that therefore it is unsustainable. Wonderful confirmation of what John Stuart Mill said, wrote a very long time ago. But of course, if this is a problem for Belgium, what should we say about the European Union and indeed about the Indian Union? I won't speak about India, but the analogy will be obvious. I concentrate on Europe. In Europe, uh, because of our interdependencies, we need the European Union. And if we want institutions that, uh, that uh, uh, if we want the European institutions to contribute to, so, to social justice, to help social justice to survive and develop rather than to undermine it, we need a more democratic Europe. We need a stronger European demos. Uh, we need a more thriving Europe-wide Europe conversation. Two powerful trends are helping, fortunately, and will keep helping to make this possible. One is the progress in the quality of machine translation of the written word, which will make it increasingly easy for uh, something written, say, in Estonian to be read straight away and understood by a Greek. The other, more important still, is the democratization of English as a lingua franca between Europeans. English overtook French about 20 years ago, a bit more than 20 years ago, as the main language of communication within the, European, within the institutions of the European Union. After Brexit, after the UK leaving the European Union, expectedly at the end of October this year, the number of native English speakers um, among European Union citizens will uh, fall dramatically. But this will not make it more difficult, but easier for English to operate as a lingua franca, because it will become, between European Union citizens, a more neutral language. English is, after all, just a sloppily pronounced combination of German and French that was imposed on the poor Celtic-speaking Brits, British population in two waves. First, an invasion uh, uh, of the Angles in the fifth century that imposed a Germanic component, and then, as if that was not bad enough, the invasion of the Normans in the 11th century that imposed the French component. English, therefore, is just a European continental language, which will, we shall quietly appropriate or reappropriate and speak with the wide variety of our European accents, which will never be as pretty as the Indian way of speaking English, but can, will not be worse than the way in which Donald Trump or Boris Johnson speak it. <laughs> what um, is thereby being offered to us as a solution for the European Union, solution to this problem, is also uh, very useful uh, within the context of my little linguistically divided country. Because just as English can be regarded as a mixture of uh, French and German, it can just as legitimately be regarded as a mixture of French and Dutch. Dutch and German being very, very close to each other. And um, that is, in fact, uh, it is, in fact, this mixture of French and Dutch called English, which is increasingly used by young Belgians, people in the younger generations, uh, to talk to each other if they don't have uh, the same native language. In the past, because of the dominance of French, it was usually French, and that is still the case for the older generation, for, for the younger generation. It's clear that when Belgians speak to each other and they don't have the same mother tongue, they speak English. So that's the uh, first uh, challenge um, for 
democracy that has to operate and that needs to operate because of these independencies at a level that is not um, uh, linguistically homogeneous. Second challenge related to the question of electoral space, and I'll therefore be going back uh, to uh, the Puna Pact. And, uh, for the public conversation to address and embrace the whole population of the European Union or Belgium, it's not enough to have at one's disposal a sufficiently cheap and efficient uh, means of communication. It's also important to have a common electoral space in such a way that those who want to govern a polity have to address the whole population of that polity, whether this polity is a country or an entity like the European Union. And this does not happen if uh, uh, there, if these people who want to govern and their parties only stand for elections with separate electorates. For example, in the European context, German candidates, German uh, parties for the European elections only face German uh, electorates, and the rhetoric they are thereby driven to adopt is one that refers to the German national interest, to fairness among all Germans, rather than to an EU-wide general interest and to fairness among all Europeans, and the same for the Greeks, for the Belgians, for the French, etc. For the civilizing force of hypocrisy to work at the right level, on the right scale, the electoral space must cover the whole population. Hence, the proposals that are, being, that are now being made, that are increasingly discussed, being made, including by President Macron, uh, but also that are being similar proposed, have been made for a longer time also in the Belgian context, to have a multi-member constituency covering the whole territory uh, for a fraction of the ter territory of Belgium in one case, of the uh, European Union in the other, for a fraction of the seats in the federal parliament in Belgium or for the European Parliament um, at, uh, in the case of the European Union. Only a fraction but a fraction of crucial importance because all the leaders of the political parties at that level, or those who want to govern at that level, will be candidates in this constituency. Such a formula of transnational, transregional uh, constituency is consistent with reserved seats. You could combine this with reserved seats and therefore with the guaranteed representations of the various parts of uh, the population, regionally of national, defined by nation in the case of the Union, but crucially, in this case, as in the case of the Puna compromise, without separate electorates. And the, the, the fact that there is a common electorate before whom these uh, the programs, the proposals need to be made uh, is uh, crucial in order to create this common demos, which is needed at the level of the European Union, as it is uh, at the level of any nation state. Third um, challenge, because what I have been saying so far in terms of challenges, is that an electoral democracy will dysfunction if it is not provided with a shared language and a common electoral space, which are both necessary to create the demos needed for a properly working democracy. In most nation states, this is provided spontaneously, as it were, by past history. In the polities in which it is not, well, steps must be taken to provide them, and I've suggested the way in which this could be done. But there are threats of a more general sort that concern the performance of electoral democracy as a, deliberate, as a deliberative conversation, even in the most favorable circumstances. This deliberative conversation is meant to be, to some degree, permanent and ubiquitous, but is particularly intense in one place, the elected assembly, and at one, one time or at particular periods, namely the electoral campaigns. But that's the challenge that in many elected assemblies, the place for a real debate for a real exchange of arguments is very, very limited, with the role of the members of parliament, members of the assemblies, confined to 
to pushing buttons as instructed by their parties and guided uh, most of the time by tactical rather than by substantive considerations. Therefore, this place where deliberation is supposed to take place more than anywhere else, but also the electoral campaign, so the times when it's supposed to uh, take place, the electoral campaigns are now increasingly corrupted by the role taken by social media in filtering information, false and true, arguments, valid or flawed, in such a way that voters get locked up in bubbles, immunized from arguments, information that may challenge the positions they previously held. Um, also in such a way that at least some candidates can address their potential voters less publicly by appealing to their prejudices, to their self-interest, and by using arguments that they would be ashamed of using in a fully open way. As a result, the deliberative component, the deliberative substance of electoral democracy, which is, of course, always far from perfect, is in the process uh, of becoming quite tenuous. Hence, various proposals and some experiments of so-called citizens' assemblies. That is, assemblies made up of people selected randomly from the electorate. The idea, so there are various places in Europe, but also elsewhere, where experiments of this sort are being made and where proposals are being made to have it uh, in a fully official way. The idea is not that such an assembly would be a really representative, uh, statistically representative microcosm of the people as a whole and therefore have the authority to express the real will of the people. The idea is rather that such an assembly would be capable of more effective deliberation than what happens either in elected assemblies or in electoral campaigns. Why? One, because though not really a random sample because of self-election, not everyone accepts to be uh, a member of such a randomly chosen assembly, uh, though not really being a random sample, a representative sample of the whole population, such an assembly would be more diverse than standard elected assemblies, and more diverse along several dimensions, and can therefore make a number of concerns, a number of perceptions more audible than what they usually are in elected assemblies. First advantage, this diversity. Second advantage, People in this assembly are not tied by any party line and can therefore disregard tactical considerations and they may, as a consequence, be more open for, real, for a real discussion, the really listening to arguments and providing arguments. Three, a third uh, advantage, people in this assembly need not be obsessed, will not be obsessed by the need to win the next election and can therefore make more room for considerations of the long term, things that will benefit not just the electors and the, uh, who will take part in the next election, but also um, think about more long term uh, impact. And fourth, it can also give to these people far more time, more resources, uh, more opportunities to listen carefully to a diversity of positions and arguments or to serious scientific expertise than can be the case for the people taking part uh, as voters uh, in, uh, at the time of an electoral campaign. How much scope could, could and should be given to such assemblies? Um, uh, it's obvious that uh, you can't have such assemblies about every single issue about which a collective decision needs, uh, needs to be taken. In my view, and they must mainly concentrate on long-term issues. How much power should be given to such randomly constituted assemblies? In my view, they should never have the power to take the ultimate decision, but uh, one must design the whole setup in such a way that they would be given the real capacity to influence the decisions ultimately taken either by an elected assembly 
or by a referendum. I end then with a fourth uh, challenge and a fourth attempt to um, answer it. Again, like the previous challenge, it's something that not restricted to those polities in which there may be a problem in creating a demos, but it applies far more generally. There is a problem with the electoral democracy that arises even in the absence of the various pathologies that I have mentioned before, even in the absence of particularity, in, even in the absence of uh, the parasitic role of, uh, or the, the corrupting role uh, played by social media. And this uh, problem derives from the fact that uh, uh, an electoral democracy is unavoidably a preference flattener, flattens the preferences in two senses. First of all, um, electors are only be given one vote. This is fine, of course, in some respects, because it means that there are not more votes given to one class, as used to be the case, or to, uh, in some countries, or to one gender, or to one ethnic group. But it's not so good in other respects, because whether you care a lot or not about the result of a, an election or a referendum, whether uh, you get exactly the same vote, whether you have thought a lot about your vote, uh, compared carefully the party programs, gathered expert advice on the key issues. Um, uh, well, um, whether you've done all this uh, or whether you've done not, uh, nothing of all this and just decided who to vote for uh, randomly as you entered the voting booth or just vote for someone because you liked uh, the first name, this is uh, still one vote for each person. So the electoral democracy is a flattener of uh, preferences in this sense. It is also a flattener, indeed a nullifier in another sense. Um, even the best electoral democracy in the world is a dictatorship of the local electorate, even as regards decisions that affect people uh, that may affect deeply some people who live elsewhere. And even more importantly, even the best democracy, electoral democracy in the world is a dictatorship of the present electorate as regards decisions that affect people too young to vote or not yet born. And of course, a growing number of decisions or non-decisions we take have a massive impact on people who are not yet born. You may think of various ways of addressing uh, these uh, challenges, and uh, there's room here for quite a bit of interesting democratic engineering, but I shall just mention, and that I'll finish with that, one way of trying to address that, or addressing that partially, one way that is messy, but rather general. And what is this way? Consists in taking to the streets. If you care a lot about an issue, you don't simply wait for some years uh, until you can cast a, a single vote. No, you can join a demonstration, you can organize a demonstration, you can go for civil disobedience. And, um, uh, and this is being done. In fact, this was stunningly uh, illustrated, I must say, amazingly illustrated uh, recently in various European countries, uh, including mine, by uh, this uh, remarkable uh, movement of uh, school strikes by secondary school pupils, initially triggered this, no doubt some of you know, by uh, a Swedish uh, teenager, a Swedish uh, girl. The aim was, the aim of the whole movement was to press government to, to take urgent action to prevent the acceleration of climate change. This was quite a remarkable uh, movement in its size, in its uh, also persistence, uh, because what was being requested from the governments was to take measures that would be costly for the local and present electorate, but whose benefit would be m enjoyed mostly by people living elsewhere and by people who are not yet born. It was, this was remarkable. 
amazing even, but perhaps what was less amazing is that the whole movement was led by teenagers, by people who uh, did not yet have the right to vote, and indeed, very strikingly, by uh, young girls. Girls have, in most countries, a higher life expectancy than, uh, than boys, so this may be one reason why they are more concerned uh, about the future than boys are. So that was my last bit of uh, food of thought, and perhaps uh, food for hope as well. Uh, school strikes, uh, no doubt, it was in Belgium, it was every Thursday, you had massive demonstrations of all these kids who were not going to school, sometimes accompanied by their teachers who had quite a bit of sympathy for their actions. So these school strikes, uh, these school, uh, strikes no doubt made possible by uh, social media and the internet, which also have the perverse effects which I mentioned before, but also have this effect, school strikes as an essential complement to electoral democracy. So that's my last bit of food for thought or food for hope. <laughs>